Hi, I'm Tyson Franklin, and welcome to this week's episode of the Podiatry Legends Podcast, a podcast designed to help you feel, see, and think differently about the podiatry profession. With me today is Jacqueline Simino, and she's a two-time Olympian, and she is studying podiatry in Quebec, Canada. She's doing the DPM program there, and Jacqueline, welcome to the Podiatry Legends Podcast. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. This is going to be an interesting story because... You've been to two Olympic Games, Rio and Tokyo, which we will touch on what that was like because I'm always curious. But at the same time, you're doing all that. So you're an elite athlete and you do synchronized swimming. And, but at the same time, you're studying to become a podiatrist. So is, is that difficult juggling two lives? <laughs> um, difficult. I guess it depends on who you, you ask. Yeah. Um, I like it. I wouldn't see my life any other way. Uh, once you find something that you're truly passionate about, and that's already, you're lucky enough to find one of those passionate things in your life, but to find two things that you're passionate about, I just find myself incredibly lucky. So there are some challenging times, but I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah, you're obviously a high achiever. My my brother's uh, daughter is quite an elite soccer player, and she was doing okay at school. And my brother said to teachers, what, do you, what would you suggest... Uh, we do to improve her marks. They said, get it into another sport. And he said, but she already trains like six days a week, plays a couple of games. And they said, get it into another sport. So they got her into rowing. And she ended up doing that well in rowing. She's now at Southern Methodist University uh, in America on a scholarship. And, and she's now like an elite rower as well. So it's sort of like high achievers, just you need to keep them busy. Yes, definitely. <laughs> That's incredible. Congratulations to her. Oh, it's mate. Yeah, like I look at it and just go, and then she's tried out for the uh, the Australian team and the World Championships, and but at the same time still studying. So obviously, like I said, people who are really high achievers, if you weren't doing synchronized swimming at that level, you would probably just be bored. I probably would. Honestly, I get bored after a weekend off where I don't have too much studying or training to do. So I do like to keep myself busy, that's for sure. Okay, so let's go back a step. Why podiatry? What got you into podiatry in the first place? Uh, so many reasons. Uh, yeah. I mean, at first, I, I wanted to be a doctor, a medical doctor. I was I was very sick as a child. Um, in and out of the hospital, the children's hospital, is losing muscle mass, losing hair. To the point when my, my mom would brush my hair, chunks of hair would fall out. And I was feeling oh. very weak, dizzy, and... The doctors didn't really know what was going on with me until I was diagnosed with celiac disease at the age okay. of eight, um, which is fairly uncommon at, at that young age. And I was just so well surrounded at the children's hospital there that I knew I wanted to become a doctor and have a positive impact like they had on me back then. Um, and fast forward now a couple of years into my athletic career, uh, right before my first Olympic game was my first Olympic trials, actually. I had a tendonitis on the top of my right foot, which is you know, a simple injury. Yeah. Um, and at the, the sports center that we have here, we have a whole bunch of experts that work with us, physiologists, physiotherapists, sports medic and doctors, but no podiatrist. And I didn't really have a specialist to look at my foot back then. And so I was prescribed naproxen back then, an anti-inflammatory, and ended up having the, one of the worst side effects of naproxen, a, a bleeding stomach ulcer. Oh. Um, and was actually hospitalized for it for a number of days. My hemoglobin levels were dangerously low. And that truly hindered my training, which initially just stemmed from a simple foot injury. And that got me thinking, who are, who's the specialist in this? Um, and that was when the initial thought process came. And then prior to the Tokyo Olympics, one of my teammates actually had a plantar fasciitis, which was undiagnosed at the time, but she ended up waiting 13 hours in the emergency room at the hospital Jeez. because we were leaving to go to the Olympics the next yeah. day. She wanted to get something diagnosed at least. Um, and I just thought that was absolutely ridiculous for, <laughs> for somebody to wait in the, in the hospital emergency room for X amount of hours to just get a plantar fasciitis diagnosis. And that's when I knew this is, this is my calling. It's amazing because what was funny when I first came across you through, I think it was LinkedIn initially, or somebody had posted something and you made a comment about the Canadian Olympic team. And then I saw that, oh, you're studying podiatry. I went, oh, this is pretty cool. This is going to be a really good story. There's going to be, there's going to be a lot of information in there. But I'm thinking, 
Well, obviously, podiatry and synchronized swimming have got nothing to do with each other. But here, here's two common injuries that synchronized swimmers have that, and I think a lot of podiatry would be going, swimming and podiatry don't really go together, but obviously they do. They, they most certainly do. Um, obviously, there are some sports that do probably require a little bit more of a podiatric attention than synchronized yeah. swimming, but uh, you know, I currently have a fibroma on my foot, and that was due to you know over massaging it after all the foot cramps that we get after pointing our feet. So I, I do think that's a, it's a sport that would benefit from having a podiatrist on board. And it's funny, synchronized swimming is. I remember when synchronized swimming came into the Olympics, and I remember watching it and going, seriously, you got people dancing in the water, and it didn't look like it was really that strenuous. But now you watch it and you go, my, like if anyone's ever been in the pool and go down, hold your breath for, for as long as you can, and then all of a sudden spring in the air and try and hold yourself there for even try and do it for two seconds, it, it's virtually impossible to do. Except you girls do it, make it look so easy. <laughs> it, it definitely comes with a lot of training. Um, and I, I maybe should have corrected you on this earlier, actually. The sport actually changed its name. It's oh. currently called artistic swimming. So after the Rio Olympic Games, the president of the International Olympic Committee said that it would be more understandable to the everyday population if we have artistic swimming, like we have artistic gymnastics. And so Makes now the sport sense. is currently called artistic swimming. And males are also joining in the sport now as well and will be seen in the upcoming Paris Olympics. Okay. I didn't know that. See, and this is, this yeah. is why I have interesting people on the podcast. Everyone listening <laughs> to this now, there'll be a few that probably go, well, of course, Tyson, we all knew that, but no, I didn't. So, well, yeah, and that makes more sense, uh, artistic swimming, because synchronized swimming, sometimes you'd watch it and go, well, you're not always synchronized because you'll have two people. I was watching one of your videos earlier this morning just to sort of get a bit of a feel for, for what you do. And, and there was you and another girl, you do a duo. And, but you weren't doing exactly the same thing. You were sort of doing slightly different before you went into it. So do you have to do dancing? Was it dancing part of your background getting into this? Most certainly not. No? <laughs> um, I, but <laughs> believe it or not, my, my mom is actually a ballet dancer and or a ballet teacher, I should say yeah. now. But uh, I, I went to one of her classes and I said, nope, was not for me. Um, I was more into powerful sports like hockey and soccer and baseball and then into speed swimming and diving. Um, so the whole artistic part doesn't necessarily come naturally to me. I like measurable things that are objective, higher, faster, stronger. Yeah. Um, but I had to adapt a little bit and fit into that synchronized swimming, artistic swimming mold. That makes sense. So getting back to podiatry, how you got into it. So you had a number of foot issues and another, another person had a foot problem. And then all of a sudden, so podiatry sort of came on the radar at that point in time in your career. Yes, it definitely did. Um, and it, it was a perfect mesh and combination to me, knowing that there's already subspecialties within podiatry, sports medicine, dermatology, uh, you know, primary care. So knowing that I was had the opportunity to be able to subspecialize into sports medicine and eventually be able to connect my two passions together uh, is definitely a dream of mine. Okay, so how old were you when you decided you were going to be a podiatrist? Ah. Uh, I was torn between uh, going to medical school or becoming a podiatrist as well, uh, but I'd say around the age of 20, 19, 20. Okay. And how old are you now? I'm 26. Okay. So everybody else that's in your course, are they slightly younger than you or about the same? We'd have a, quite a good mix in my cohort. So there's 25 students that are accepted per year. It's quite a competitive program considering that it's the only program in the country. And it mixes from the age of 20 to 50. Uh, we oh, have right, a okay. mom in our court and we also have a dad in our court. Uh, so I fit somewhere in the middle of all that. Okay. So to just let people know, so you are studying uh, Doctor of Podiatric Medicine and it's at the University of Quebec. Correct. Okay. And it's a, it's a four-year DPM program that you do. And you can actually, at the end of that four years, you can say, that's enough for me. I'm done. I am now a podiatrist. And you can do everything that a podiatrist would do in the UK, Australia, except you don't do surgery. If you want to do surgery, you then need to go and do a residency somewhere. 
Precisely, yes. And, and we're currently working with some schools in the states to see if we could facilitate that residency process for those who'd like to go into surgery. But it, we do have that benefit where we could practice straight yeah. out of school. So is your plan to go and do surgery or would you prefer to go, no, I just want to stay as a, like a primary care podiatrist? I definitely like to keep my options open. Mm. Um, at the moment, I am in contact with the residency director in the States who works a lot with some sports teams. I'm currently part of uh, the California Podiatric Sports Medicine Committee as well, where we look at different sports cases. So I think that is something that's definitely up my alley and something that I'd like to explore. Uh, but I do like to keep my options open because you never know what the future holds. Yeah, I know. It's it's one of those things. And, and prior to starting the podiatry course, you had to do an undergraduate degree beforehand. Yes. So we had a, a college degree here in Quebec uh, in French. They call it CIGEP in English uh, college. Uh, so a big portion of our court uh, did this college degree, but we do have others who came from medical degrees from pharmacy to then switched over to podiatry or physiotherapy. Uh, so it, it's a big mix and then there's not one linear path to get into podiatry. Yeah. And one thing I'll point out to people too, if you're thinking about, oh, maybe I might go to Quebec and do the four year DPM course over there. If you don't speak French, it's going to be very difficult. You were saying that 95% of the courses in French and the 5% that isn't is only because they haven't translated it yet. Exactly. Yes. They, they've done a, a big work, a big amount of work in the past couple of years to translate all the courses into French, uh, because initially our program was taught by teachers from America. But now yeah. that we have a lot of Canadians that are graduated from here in the States, we have a lot of Canadian professors that come and do speak French and so teach in French as well. Okay. It's really, I just think it's really interesting when, when you get to share how podiatry is is taught in, in different countries because I've had a number of Canadian, I call them Canadian podiatrists, even though they'll say they're uh, chiropodists or for my UK friends, chiropodists, because they can't, they can't use the term podiatry. So it's just, it's really interesting how the different countries and, and just the, the pathway to become a podiatrist. I, I had someone from India a while ago and they're coming back on to give me an update on what's happening over there. And over there, you've got to become uh, like a general practitioner first, a doctor first, then you're going to do podiatry afterwards. That's their pathway. That's fascinating. Yeah, uh, so, and you can uh, probably have a huge background for what you need to practice on. Yeah, but in the end, we're, we're all doing the same thing. Other than, okay, some might be doing more surgery than others, but in the end, we're, we're all looking after patients and we're all looking at, at certain foot problems. Exactly. We all have that one thing in common. So at the moment, you are currently in your third year. Yes. Okay. How are you finding it so far? Oh, I'm, I'm truly loving it. Um, as, as you know, we do follow the American method. So the first two years are hardcore theory with 10 classes a semester. And now we're finally in clinic in the morning. And it's, it's lovely to be able to put all of that theory into practice and finally yeah. start to see your own patients uh, practice more hands on. It's 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 amazing. So you said, and in your notes you said that. So your third year you said is like an internship. So you're like internally still at the university. Then in your fourth year you said it's more of an externship. So you, do you go out and spend time at other clinics? Yes. So in our internship year here in third year, we have a number of rotations in uh, radiology and sports medicine into primary care. Um, and internal medicine. And then in fourth year in our externship year, we have a number of rotations that are not done at our university clinic. So those are done in private practice, in surgery, where we may have the option to go to the States and yep. um, do some a rotation there as well. So it's, it's nice to be able to have that diversity in our internship and externship year. Okay, do they line up where you go? Like, is there a list of these are all the clinics that we suggest you go to, or is it up to you to go and find them? For the most part, it's truly up to us, uh, which I do like the possibility of going anywhere in the world. As, as you mentioned, I mean, podiatry is, is all around the world. We do end up yeah. doing the same thing at the end of the day. So it's, we have that opportunity to go wherever we'd like to do that externship. Okay, so you could do it in America, but could you also go to, like, say, chiropodists or chiropodists in Canada and spend time with them? Or would they say, no, you can't do that? Or would they say, yes, you can, certain ones you could do that? 
there are certain standards that we do have to meet for the externship. So it's something that the director of the program would have to go over and make sure that they meet certain criteria. Yeah. But I do know certain students who have even gone abroad and say Singapore or Bermuda and whatnot and haven't had an issue yet going to shadow or work with podiatrists or chiropodists. Okay, if you want a contact in Bermuda, I can give you a contact in Bermuda. It looks like a beautiful That place. would be lovely. Yeah, if you like off off air, when we finish, I'll give you a contact for Bermuda. And if they're listening to this, they'll be going, yes, Tyson, thank you very much. Because they were they were looking for a podiatrist at one stage. And I said, oh, I know oh. someone in Sydney who's looking for a job or who's looking at changing their job. And so I put them in touch with each other. Now he's working over there and absolutely loving it. He's just going, this is the best job in the world. He's getting paid really well. Awesome. It's a great environment. And, and because Bermuda is still like under the influence of the United Kingdom, or it's in the Commonwealth, they play cricket. He, they, they just, they just get Australians. So, so yeah, there's a contact there. And if you want to ever want to come to Australia, just uh, let me know. There's heaps of people over here that could put you in touch with without a problem at all. Oh, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. I'll definitely so there, keep that option open. Yeah, is there a certain amount of time that you have to spend away or how, how do you report back to the university that you're not just in Australia sitting in a pub drinking? <laughs> so we do have certain <laughs> things that we need to do during these yeah. rotations. Uh, we do need to meet a certain a number of hours requirement for the rotations. And we also need to present journal clubs. So every week we have a journal club that we present to our supervising podiatrist or doctor at Coalition, and yeah. they report back to the director of the program. Uh, so there's a number of uh, systems, I guess, to monitor what we're doing and not just having the great time of our lives in Australia. <laughs> yeah, I, know I was going to say, you got to be careful. Yeah, you ha you'd have to be careful where you go. Because I know when I had my clinic here in Cairns, we used to take probably one or two students a year, we would have come through and spend a certain amount of time with us. Absolutely loved having them there because it, one, it gave you an insight on, okay, what are you learning at university at the moment? Just sort of see, you know, are we keeping up to date with, with everything? Is there anything new? But they were just, some of them were just like sponges. They really wanted to learn. And they, they would be like your shadow the whole time. Couldn't get rid of them, asking you questions. And you knew that they would leave going to be better for that experience. But you'd have some that would turn up and you just go, oh, my God, yeah, do, you, do you really want to be a podiatrist? They would turn up late, leave early, and they would just go do the minimal amount just to go through the, the motions. And they, they were few and far between. Majority were really interested in podiatry. Ah, that, that's a shame. Um, I, I'd like to think that the program here, at least in Canada, is a a good good job at it say weeding out maybe it's not the best wording to use but yeah. weeding out those students who are fairly passionate and want to constantly learn because this is a profession that we're not stagnant in our mm. in our cognitive level we're constantly learning we're constantly evolving there's papers that are currently coming out you know as we speak and so you, you need to be able to stay up to date with that okay now this isn't going to be a creep this might be a creepy question <laughs> <laughs> Anyone listening to this is going to get twice. That was a creepy question, but you're in your you're in your bedroom at the moment. Yes. Okay. Okay. Now people are going. Okay, Tyson, this is starting to get creepy. It won't be if people are watching the video. Okay. But you have an anatomy picture on the back wall of um in your bedroom. Yes, I also have Mr. Bones, my skeleton, next to me here as well oh, too. I don't okay, know now, now people are knowing that. Okay, it wasn't a creepy question after all. I'm just watching you, and all of a sudden, I looked in the background, and I see this anatomy picture on the back wall, and I thought, well, that's your bedroom as well. I said, that is pretty cool to actually have that all up in your room. So you're constantly just always looking at it. Yeah, constantly that, and then Mr. Bones, my friend over here, uh, the skeleton. Mr. Bones. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I remember our skeleton, we used to have it. We'd put different hats on it, and I'd, we'd uh, put a different, dress it up every now and then to uh to make it put it fun. put it at the kitchen table <laughs> yeah. so with um because of your say, oh no what was that uh, i was gonna say i gotta say you know having mr bones or a big skeleton was definitely handy in, in first year learning anatomy and all the different you know tuberosities of the bones or whatnot and I, it was fun to have that visual image yeah so the one that you've got now i take it it's uh, made from plastic it's not real bones is it 
<laughs> yes, it's definitely made from plastic. Yeah, uh, but see, we do have a, a cadaver lab that we work with as well. Yeah, see, when I went through, we, we were still able to get uh, real skeletons, like real bones. Oh, wow. And but then they sort of stopped doing it because they reckon there was, I don't know if this is just a, a rumour, but there was a, a rumour going around that there it was almost like a black market thing. They were bumping people off to supply the skeletons. Wow. So all of a sudden they went, they sort of broadened into it. Now, someone might be listening to us go, Tyson, that is just an urban myth. That is rubbish. But it's a, but it's a damn good story. It is. <laughs> <laughs> so never let the truth get in the way of a really good story. So, but yeah, when I went through, you, it, when I f started first year, you could still get uh, foot skeletons and all that, that were real bones. But by the time I finished the course, all this, the, then you couldn't, it was all plastic. And those, those skeletons or foot skeletons, where would you get them from? Oh, I can't remember. We just order them. We just order them in. Oh, wow. All right. <laughs> Almost as you'd be able to Amazon yourself. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It was sort of, yeah, it was sort of popular. And then all of a sudden it just, it stopped. And then there was this rumor going around that, oh, no, it was, it was a bit, uh, getting a bit dodgy how they were actually providing where, where all these skeletons were actually coming from. I don't know the truth of that. Like I said, someone's listening to this is going to shoot me down. But anyone who listens to this podcast on a regular basis knows that we say a few things that may not always be factual, but it's fun. They're fun facts. Anyway, back to you. Not, not about skeletons. Um, so obviously sports medicine would be a big interest to the podiatry side for you. Yes, definitely. Um, having trained at what we call here the Institut National de Sport de Québec. So that's a fancy long word in French for a national training center. Yeah. Uh, we have four in, in Canada. And it means that a lot of sports are centralized in these national training centers. And the one here close to me in Montreal, uh, we have gymnastics, diving, water polo, hockey, speed skating, a, a large number of sports. And training in the pool, actually, we had a very neat setup where we'd have our specific pool for ourselves, for our, sort of our cystic swimmers. And right next to our pool, we had all of these glass walls with the medical clinic that was there. Yeah. And so we'd constantly see all these gymnastics athletes being rolled in in wheelchairs, holding onto their ankle or their foot, or, you know, a diver landing just off in a warm up practice and limping all the way up in the medical clinic because of foot injuries. And, and so I saw a need for a podiatrist in the clinic. And this is what I'd like to maybe come and fill in that gap. Okay. So, and I saw through on social media, you're connected with Mike Donato. Yes. Yeah. The president of the American Academy of Podiatric Sports Medicine. So I think spending time with him would be fantastic. I actually um, heard about him for the first time through your podcast, actually. Oh, good. I, I listened through his story and I truly love your podcast because it, it really exposes us to a number of podiatrists across the world and listening to their stories and it really inspires others to kind of branch out there and get into different specialties so i think he's definitely somebody i'd keep into mind uh and hopefully shadow one day yeah no he's like when i had him on the uh podcast because a lot of times i've asked mm -hmm. certain people that have been in high up in certain positions and associations and they've like said no they've just shot me down didn't want to come on and I've, and initially it used to be disappointing and now you sort of just go, well, there's a lot of other people like yourself and like Mike who have just got amazing stories who want to come on, who openly want to share because they know there's a, there's a lot of new recent graduate students that are coming through. And even if they just pick up one little thing, then it's going to be beneficial. Definitely. Most other than, other than my story it... about skeletons, that was just, that was a terrible <laughs> story. But <laughs> other than that. Who knows? Some might find that interesting and want to go into it for the cadaver lab. Who knows? Yeah, somebody might do some research on it and go, Tyson is just makes stuff up. But I didn't. That was just, that was, like I said, that was a myth. But with, um, so, are the, like, so you listen to the podcast yourself. Do the other students in your year or years listen to it as well? Or you have no idea? Uh, there are a few, yes. So I mentioned to some of my my my, um, my colleagues, I guess, today in clinic yeah. that I was had this comp uh, this interview with you this evening, and they were all very interested. And I've been listening to your podcast for a while, like myself. And so, uh, yes, there are definitely I could confirm that there are a few. Okay, that's great. That's that's what we want. And I reckon the the more students I get, I think the more 
students, recent graduates, we can get listening to this podcast and get them to listen to the guests and what they've done in their careers. Nobody will leave the profession. They, you'd have to be not the only people that'll leave will be the people that should probably have never started. Yeah, it's just not for them. Yeah, they should need to become a florist. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you can't cut it in podiatry, become a florist. <laughs> Manual dexterity, I suppose, would be transferable. Yeah. <laughs> I know. And do you know um, uh, Jim McDonald at all? Who? My Dr. Dr. Jim McDonald. So he's a uh, an American DPM. But oh he, yes. But he's in your part of the um, part of the world. He's in Alberta, I think. Is it Alberta? Uh, he, I think he's moved around quite a bit. But funny enough, actually, I spoke to him um, after was it after my first Olympics. I, oh, I right. reached yeah. out to him on social media, uh, asking him a little bit more about podiatry and the profession. And it was really just through reaching out to him that confirmed me wanting to go into podiatry even more. So he's been incredibly generous with his time. Oh, he's yeah, he's fantastic. Him and I do the podiatry marketing podcast together. And, yes. and that's a lot of fun. So anyone that's like the business side of podiatry, that, that's purely business, that's the podcast to have a listen to as well. But Jim and I are doing a one-day marketing workshop in uh, Chicago in October, which is going to be a lot of fun. But yeah, stay in touch with uh, Jim as well, because he's not a swimmer, he's a runner. So completely, completely different sports. But I'm pretty sure he has been on different sporting teams at quite elite levels as well. He has, yes, I believe it, it was the Rio Olympic Games that we might yeah. have actually crossed that he was there for as well. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm almost certain that's I should if Jim's listening to this, he's going to be going, Tyson, yeah, I've told you all this before. So <laughs> if, if I don't write it down, I'm going to forget. So what's, <laughs> so what's next with you? You're, so you've still got a year and a half of podiatry to go. And oh, when's, the, when's the year end? What, what time of the, what month of the year is your end of third year? Um, that's a great question. We, we kind of go through schooling, um, so we don't really have any summers off. Uh, apart from first year. So yeah. my third year started in the month of May this year and it will end in the month of May in 2024. Oh, okay. And uh, then I'll be graduating in 2025, probably around April or May. Okay. So it's about yeah, 80, 80 or 20 months basically to go. You, you're going to be doing that study, but at the same time, you're still involved with the Canadian Olympic Committee. Are you going to compete at the yeah. next Olympic? You're still training to compete at the next one? Uh, that Tyson, that's a great question. <laughs> okay, I'm glad I asked I, it. Uh, what What is the answer? Are, are you Are you considering retiring, or are you like, no, I'm still good? Well, um, I, after the Tokyo Olympic Games, I, I threw a retirement party. I, yeah. I was dead set on retiring and turning the page and moving on to podiatry. And um, I'm gonna have to apologize to everybody who's at that party because uh, <laughs> I think the sport misses me a little bit too much. Uh, and so I'm, I, I, I'm currently in a negotiation phase with my national sport organization to potentially return for the Paris Olympics. Oh, cool. That's good. And one thing I wanted to know, how would you compare the Rio Olympics to Tokyo, like pre, pre-COVID and, oh, I wouldn't even say it's post-COVID, COVID. What, what was it like, the two different Olympics? It must have been weird. It was two completely different games, two completely different worlds. Uh, Rio, it was it was an incredible Olympics. I don't know if it was just because of my first Olympics and my childhood dream coming true, but just the, the fact that there's there's the stands are full. Yeah. Um, it's it's one thing at a World Championships to have full stands, but to beat the Olympics and there's there's something a little bit more special, a little bit more attention that comes on every four years at the Olympic Games. And just the outreach too, that you're not just seeing your four walls in your room like we were in Tokyo. We'd only be allowed to go see our field of play, which was the pool, yeah. come back to the athlete village, eat their meal within a certain amount of time, and then go back into our room and do our COVID tests until it comes back negative and go out and train once again. So in, in Rio, we definitely got to experience the, the games experience a lot more, go speak to other athletes and go out, visit uh, the country a little bit, eat different kinds of food. So um, I, I'm hoping Paris will be different. I, I certainly <laughs> believe it will be, um, to have that more of a normal game experience. Yeah. Does that feel, is that part of the urge 
to say go to another Olympics because she went to Tokyo and you go, oh, I feel like I got I got gypped a little bit. It was it was it was like it was an Olympics, but not an Olympics. We we would refer to it in Australia as a Clayton's Olympics. Clayton's used to be this drink. It was the drink you had when you're not having a drink. It was an, it was like a one of the first non-alcoholic drinks. Ah. So, we, so yes, I, it would definitely be a Clayton Olympics. <laughs> yeah. So you're at the Olympics, but you weren't. You didn't really get to experience because I think even the Australian team, it was like they flew over wherever your sport was. You flew over there, you did it, and then they stuck you on a plane and sent you straight back home again. There was no hanging around for any closing ceremony. There was nothing. Exactly. It was the same thing for the Canadian team. Uh, I was lucky enough to be near the end, so I was able to experience the closing ceremonies, which was a little underwhelming having yeah. experienced the closing ceremonies in Rio, where Rio likes to throw big parties and carnivals. Oh, yeah. And in Tokyo, it was it was silent. You know, on TV, it must have looked great. And I know they did a phenomenal job, you know, with all the artistry and whatnot. But actually being there in an empty stadium with no one sitting in the seats just seemed a little odd to me, uh, which is why I probably have that itch to go relive that real experience one more time. Yeah. Yeah, I could totally. I've had friends that have done the Commonwealth Games and when they were really big and one's not so big, and they said the same thing, just completely different. But I haven't spoken to anyone that's gone to the two Olympics. So I thought it would have been, um, would have been doing. What was it like when you were actually competing? Because, like at Rio, you would have had the stands full of people cheering you on. When you're in Tokyo, was it just an empty pill? Did it feel like it was a training session with judges? It felt exactly like that. A, a training session. For me, it felt like a national team trials because for us, okay. it's very similar where it's all very silent. And in, in the arena where we were competing, people weren't allowed to yell or scream. They were just allowed to clap. And there wasn't anybody there enough so that you could hear any clapping. So all you heard was the little flickers of the camera because there were a bunch of press there. Um, but that was it. And sometimes you need that little bit of external encouragement to get you through a routine, a routine that's incredibly difficult where your lungs are burning, your muscles, every little ounce of them is just telling you to stop. And then that external reinforcement just gets you through. We didn't necessarily have that in Tokyo. So a lot of that had to come internally. And not only just the games themselves were challenging, but the preparation leading up to the games was, I think, the most challenging part of itself. You know, having the majority of sport training centers in Canada being closed, we had to move to Hungary for a, a long period of time prior to the Olympics to be able to just train at yeah. a pool and, and see your pool and your room and be away from your friends and your family. So that was a huge mental aspect for the team that I was training with at the time as well. So you said something then, because when you're watching artistic swimming, see, no, so I've, I've taught, I've learned something new already. When you're watching it, you'll be a couple of minutes into your routine and you still got these big smiles on your face and your hands flicking up in the air and everything's looking like, this is so easy. We're having fun out here, but, but your lungs are literally burning and the, your muscles are, but so you're in pain, but at the same time, you've got this smile on your face, like you're just having a, a, a Sunday picnic. Yeah. That's the artistic part of the sport for you right there. Um, <laughs> I reckon you'd pass, you'd pass a lie detector test really easy, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> Except if you attach it to any sort of measurements that measure heart rate or whatnot. But uh, uh, no, I mean, if it were up to me, I'd be wearing a bathing cap with goggles and really yeah. just be focusing on the technical part of the sport. Uh, but no, unfortunately, judges do look at that. And if it looks difficult, uh, the artistic judges may not like that very much and score you lower. So, and when you're actually pretty much, could you all dive in the pool, close your eyes and still be able to do the same routine? You're not really looking at each other. You just, once you're in the water, you just know what you've got to do next. I'd say individually or even in the duo pair, we'd probably be able to do that. And in, in a team setting, there are some, some dangers associated with it because we do throw some people up into the air and yeah. you would be able, you would be able to have that visual feedback to be able to see where they're landing because we do have a number of concussions in our sport and it may not seem like it but there is a lot of contact underwater that does happen so we we do really rely on that visual aspect as well yeah no it's only just a question because my daughter uh does dancing and last year at their dance concert or what one of their uh 
one of the concerts they were doing or competitions and the lights went out while they were doing acrobatics and and I said to my daughter afterwards, oh, what was that like? She went, my God, she says, it was the most terrifying thing because we had people in the middle of doing flips and spins and, the, and it was absolutely pitch black. And she said, and even though we all knew where each other were, but once you'd thrown somebody in the air or something was going on, she was completely, completely different. And, and you, heard a th- you heard a couple of thuds where people sort of fell because they'd missed and things like that. So I was wondering about synchronised swimming. Is it just... But so there is some visual going back to the pain side of things though, the pain you go through with your lungs and the burning for the average person, how could you, how could we understand that pain level that you're going through? Is there something that you've done outside of swimming that you go, this is what it feels like, like trying to sprint 400 meters and then just trying to do it. Is there some equivalent? An analogy that I like to say oftentimes is, like running a five kilometer sprint per se okay. where you're trying to run you know under 14 13 minutes with a nose clip on and you're holding your breath so say you hold your breath for a minute Incredible. and then you breathe for a minute hold your breath for a minute and then you breathe and that's when you really get that anaerobic system to kind of kick in and you feel that that burn that lactic acid building up and uh there, there's truly nothing like that on top of that being upside down in the water completely disoriented spinning around and trying to make it look easy at the same time yeah like i i do muay thai and and we'll be there kicking pads and doing all that and we'll be doing it at the point where my lungs are burnt i can't breathe anymore i'm in pain i, I just i have to stop i cannot smile i literally <laughs> even though i will have a sort of ah i'll grin at the at the coach like ah i'm having a good time but you can tell by my face that i i am in I'm done. Yeah, I, I need to have that 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 break. So it is incredible what you can do. Out of curiosity, how long can you hold your water under breath? Oh, how, let me do that. How long can you hold your water under breath? One more thing. That will get edited out. Not in the video. I'll leave it in the video. But how long can you hold your breath underwater? Would you like to guess? I reckon I'm thinking like big wave surfers have got to be able to hold the breath for at least five minutes, I think. So I'm assuming you would be four and a half minutes or more. I reckon you could probably go oh. up to like seven. Oh, you're very close. Very, very close. Um, so five minutes and 11 seconds. Okay. Yeah. Cause I know, cause I, I was watching some shows, I used to do surfing when I was a kid and I was terrified whenever I got crunched and I was under the water for too long, I'd really start to freak out. And then I was watching a documentary on these big wave surfers and they say, if you cannot hold your breath for four minutes, do not do big wave surfing. You will drown because that's like the minimum. And, and a lot of them will get held down a little bit longer and that's when they die because they haven't, haven't done the training. So five minutes, that's a long time. Do you test it every, every year? Do you sort of try and break your record? Uh, it's not something we test regularly, but prior to the Tokyo Olympics, we had a session with the, the Navy SEALs that came up to Canada. And we actually had some surfers there with us too, so our Canadian Olympic surfers. Yeah. And we had a kind of a breathing exercise, which then they led us into holding our, our breath for a time period of time. And I was pretty much at par with the uh, the Canadian surfers as well. Wow, that's amazing. So have you ever done um, free diving at all? Never. No, I, I do have some friends, though, that were synchronized swimmers and then transitioned into to free diving. And they're they're currently world champions in that. So I, I do think there's some transferable skills there. Yeah, because I, I know a couple of people that uh, went and did some free diving courses just over in Bali. And they said the same thing that, oh, my God, this is some of the people go down there and they go so far and they stay there for so long. And you've already come up, gone down, come back up again. And they're still down there. And again, it's just incredible, the lung capacity. So this is something that you, so when you first started, how long could you hold your breath underwater for? Were you normal like the rest of us or were you always a, a bit of an overachiever? Uh, to be honest, uh, this is the part that I, I really dislike the most about the sport. I was terrified of doing underwater. So I'd say at most when I started off was maybe 15 seconds at most. Yeah. Um, I just didn't like the feeling of my lungs burning and contracting. And, and then I realized it was all a mental game. And 
you know, accepting all of this, these things going on in your body and, and letting your brain know it's okay. Uh, but it's still a part that I don't really like to do. Uh, so I had to work gradually up, you know, 15 to 30 seconds to then a minute to two minutes. And uh, it, it definitely came with a lot of, of coaching as well. Yeah. So it is a real mental game as well. It's that feeling the, the pain and then realizing no, I'm not going to die and just convincing yourself I'm not going to die right now. I can go that little bit longer. And then it's sort of keep constantly pushing yourself through that pain. Exactly. It's truly going against your, your intuition as well, and especially when you get to a point where your lungs have almost stopped contracting and you're starting to see black spots a little bit <laughs> everywhere. And that then it's a mental uh, game. I'll tell you that. Oh, my God. So it so it makes podiatry look really easy. Like the, like even though yes, you have to do a lot of study in podiatry, but when it comes to actually pushing yourself to do what needs to get done, to do the work, where some people, yeah, you know, like some people are, are, are mentally stronger than others. So when all of a sudden the pressure's on with the exams and and life and boyfriends and girlfriends and work commitments and things like that, some people crack under the pressure, and other people it doesn't bother them; they just thrive through it. So obviously that sort of pressure. I don't think it would bother you any at all. I don't think it would bother you at all. No, not quite. <laughs> a lot of people in the in the program describe me as kind of like the energy bunny. Uh, yeah. You know, when people are pulling all nighters before exams, you know, I'm still sleeping my normal hours and I'm still training and still working and still going to school. And I think I just truly thrive under that pressure. And as you mentioned earlier on too, I, I think I, some people are just made to, function under you know a great amount of stress and a lot mm. of things on their plate and i think that's when I, I i truly thrive which is strange to think you know we, we're all different <laughs> yeah i think some people uh, enjoy pain my brother says that to me he said yeah you're 57 years of age you still go to muay thai three four five times a week he said you actually enjoy the pain of it and he said and he reckons i'm very similar to his daughter who's the rower and the soccer player he said she loves the pain of training like when she finishes it and she's aching and body parts are sore, he goes, she actually really gets off on that. And I went, yeah, yeah, I do. I, I actually, if I get a big bruise on me, I'm like, oh yeah, it feels good. It doesn't, but it does. It's it's almost rewarding, you know, yeah. knowing that you've done a good job, knowing that you've given your maximum amount of effort. Yeah, it is. So I want to move on to what you're currently doing at the moment with the IOC project with the United Nations. Can you tell me a little bit about that before we wrap up? Because that was interesting. Yes, definitely. Uh, so the International Olympic Committee has this program called the Young Leaders Program. And every four years, I believe, they um, start a new court with 25 people from around the world in different countries, different backgrounds. And they pick individuals who'd like to create a social project. And so I went through this social business development course with the IOC. And in the end of this, I was I was selected um, to represent Canada and, and, and North America in this. And so my project in partnership with the United Nations is to address some of their sustainable development goals. Uh, mine, which will address a quality education, health and well-being and partnership for the goals. And something that I've come to realize throughout my athletic career is that as high performance athletes, we're very fortunate, you know, we yeah. have access to, you know, the top of the creme de la creme experts in their specific fields. And your average everyday Joe, uh, for instance, my parents, you know, don't have access to certain medical care. Uh, you know, healthcare is free here in Canada, but uh, it's hard to get access to a family doctor. And my father was actually diagnosed with diabetes a couple of months ago. Uh, and it's something that could have been screened for years ago. And he yeah. ended up developing a lot of symptoms and fortunately a lot of other systemic issues for something that was just diagnosed later on in life. And for diseases that are genetic, there, there are some genetic components, but there's some that they can be preventable. And so what I'd like to do is to create a comprehensive platform that enables everyday people to have access to these specific systems, that quality education on what you can do to prevent yourselves from developing heart disease and diabetes, um, you know, eating healthy, what does that look like for you? Exercising, yeah. what does that look like for you? A good weight, a good health, really just optimizing your daily lifestyle habits. Yeah, and it's true because a lot of people, when they think exercise, 
they're thinking they've got to go to kickboxing or they've got to they've got to go and run 5k's and it's it's just getting active and and what what's good for one person may not be good for for somebody else but also doing that exercise and also being aware of what you're putting in your body you know, exactly. I, I, like I love ice cream. I must admit, I, I'm a, I just mm. love ice cream. However, I know that I can't eat a bucket of ice cream every day if I want to keep living. <laughs> just, I know it's not going to be good for me. So is this part of the education, educating people about a certain amount of exercise and what they're putting in their body, just being more of an awareness? Exactly, precisely. And and with the resources of the International Olympic Committee and their partners, I'd like to be able to find a way to incentivize people to do so. Um, you know, have specific deals on certain products or healthy food products, for instance, more vegetables or getting special deals and products on um, products that will actually help you get to that healthy lifestyle that you're striving to to get to. Um, so I'm I'm hoping in a couple of years that's what I'll aim to. But the education component is something that's definitely key in this project. Yeah, and I'll point out to people that this is a volunteer role. You're not being paid to do this. This is something you're doing purely with all your spare time. This, this is what you're doing between training and, and studying. And you said you're looking for experts who would like to be involved. What type of experts? Yeah, so at the moment, I'm currently looking for uh, software developers, anybody who works in within software because we're looking to develop an app platform or at least a, an app. A platform that's more web-based and so i have uh, some people from japan who have already expressed their interest that i'll be working with but uh project managers people who are involved in marketing um specifically that we're not only specifically looking at canada wide we're looking to maybe expand this worldwide since it is in, in collaboration with the united nations so if there's anybody yeah. across the world that would maybe like to spear, spearhead this in in their specific region i'd definitely be open to to working with them and that's a volunteer role as well for them, no matter what their skill set is. It is at the moment, yes. Yeah, <laughs> and that that's always going to be the difficult part finding people sometimes, because, like I said, it's uh, it's finding the time. Like you, you're managing to actually fit this in with everything else you're doing, which I think is amazing. It's and when you find something again that you're passionate about, you will find yeah. time to do it. So that's, that's kind true. of where the stems from as well. And they always say, if you want something done, give it to a busy person. <laughs> don't, know, don't really know how that works, but they just say, so I think busy people manage their time really well. And going back to when we first started this conversation, I mentioned my niece. And I said, one of the things why her marks improved was because they said that she, because she was busy with soccer, well, had to do rowing early in the morning, soccer was afternoon or in the evening. So she only had a dedicated amount of time to study because she only had the dedicated time she actually studied because she knew that's the only time i've got to do it so it was very organized so i'd say you're exactly the same with your training with your studying being at university and you probably allow a little bit of time for social life but definitely you need to have that balance yeah but you're not going to dedicate too much to the social life because then that will eat into something else and this is where i think people are going to get more disciplined with, I've, I've spoken to people and say, oh, I really want to be a sports podiatrist. Okay, well, okay, how much extra time do you put into that outside of your normal work, family and all? Oh, well, yeah, like I'm just, I'm too busy at the moment. I'm not bullshit. You're not, you just, you just don't want it bad enough. Exactly. I strongly believe that you will make time for the things that matter to you. Yeah. Uh, and that all comes in with time management. It's something that I've been fortunate enough to learn from a young age and falling into a sport that requires a lot of hours of training. Uh, you have to learn how to, to manage your time appropriately and accordingly and identify those things that are important to you and fit those in, in that time. Yeah, well, every elite athlete I've ever met in any sport has been an awesome time manager. And all the people, all the could have beens or yeah, wannabes, terrible at managing their time so i think anyone you, listening you to this that. manage your time if you want to get more done you just need to manage your time yes it, it certainly does help so jacqueline if people wanted to reach out to you is there a certain way that they could uh connect with you if someone was listening to this they wanted to talk to you about the un work that you're doing or or anything else or they just want to autograph at some stage um <laughs> 
is it is there an ideal way you're liking to reach out to you they could definitely reach out on social media on instagram at jacqueline underscore simono um twitter has changed a little bit so i will see if my <laughs> access yeah. will continue on twitter um uh, but uh, instagram is probably a good way to reach out as well as linkedin and if not, my email is jacqueline.simino at olympian.org. And I'll be more than happy to uh, answer any messages. Okay. So Jacqueline, I want to thank you for coming on the Podiatry Legends podcast. This has been a lot of fun. I've enjoyed this. I've learned a lot about artistic swimming, which I did not know. I didn't realize the pain you went through because you make it look so easy. So I want to thank you very much, but don't run away when I pr stop recording because I want to give you the uh, Bermuda details as well yes so, please <laughs> so thank you very much for <laughs> for coming on and do you want to do you want to sign off in french for your student oh, yeah. friends if they're listening to this so i'll let you have the final word in in french and then you can tell me afterwards what you actually said perfect je voudrais remercier grandement tyson franklin de l'australie pour me avoir sur votre podcast aujourd'hui et à tout le monde qui l'écoute N'hésitez pas de euh, me contacter si vous aimeriez être partie de ce projet. Un gros merci à tout le monde, à les écouteurs et Tyson encore une fois. That was awesome. Okay, so thank you very much. <laughs>